This is an oral history interview for the UAH Space Archive Collection. Today is March 7th, 2006. Our guest is Dr. Ted Paludin. I'm Charles Lundquist. Ted, we're happy to have you here with us this morning and thank you for coming. Thank you. To get things started, could you give us a little bit of a history of your career, where you uh, spent your childhood, where you went to school, and how you got into the space program? Well, I grew up in lower Alabama, south Alabama that is, and uh, went to uh, a rural school in uh, Raymer, Alabama, which is in uh, Montgomery County, rural Montgomery County. I went to Alabama Polytechnic Institute, which was later named Auburn University. I graduated from Auburn in 1951 at the age of 20 and immediately came here to Redstone Arsenal to work in the, uh, what later became known as the Von Brown team. I think I was the youngest male member of the Von Brown team. Uh, there were plenty of females. Uh, in fact, uh, I remember that Bonnie Holmes came to work the same day I did. Somehow I was lucky and uh, a member of the team had just been fired. He uh, was in charge of the temperature measurements and they had just discovered that he had uh, belonged to the Communist Party while he was in college and this uh, got him uh, cashiered out and I took over his job. So I was making temperature measurements, and uh, this was a uh, tricky thing in those days. They were tiny, delicate little things that uh, I cemented to various parts of the uh, rocket we were working on, which didn't have a name then. <coughs> and uh, I was cementing these things with ceramic cements to various parts of the rocket, which later was known as the Redstone. And, uh, these uh, were little platinum wire things. And among other places, I cemented these things to the plane shield. In uh, 19, that was 1951, beginning 1951. In 1953, I was uh, assigned to go to Cape Canaveral to uh, help get the first rocket ready for launch. Uh, that became the first American ballistic missile to be uh, launched. And it was a qualified success. Uh, I recall that uh, well, it was quite a babysitting job to keep those uh, instruments working on the thing because, uh, as I say, they were delicate. And after the launch, which we watched as it went out of sight, uh, one of the uh, Germans who was working on it came roaring up to me, his face as red as a beet, and said that my temperature measurements had failed. They had, he has the telemetry records in his hand and he shows me that they climb and they go to this very absurd temperature and go off scale. And we were both looking out the window and there you could see the cloud where the, uh, the missile had re-entered and it crashed into the ocean, which was, after all, the target, and uh, had... Uh, come in, you know, it's supposed to go a couple of hundred miles and it had gone 8,000 yards. And I said, well, it's quite possible that the measurements are correct and something went wrong. Well, indeed, these were measurements on the flame shield, which you were quite familiar with. And uh, the, uh, the, the flame shield had melted through. The temperature measurements showed the uh, temperature going up to the melting point of steel and uh, it had melted. And uh, so you and I became celebrities, although it wasn't really our intention because that's exactly what the problem was. So when we got back to Huntsville, that was a big program that you had to devise a way to keep it from melting, and I had to keep making measurements on the thing. So Well, I wasn't involved in that particular I problem. Think, I thought you were, had to make the um, some of the ceramics that protected no, the thing not, later. No, not I. That, Who was that? Maybe the Bob Lindstrom. Now, maybe. It, uh, I was thinking you were already involved at that no, point. No, I didn't arrive till 54. Gosh, another year. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay. I think it was Bob Lindstrom. Maybe. Okay, anyway, uh, 
And I became a celebrity at least. Yeah. And uh, because, uh, gosh, I was going out to White Sands with these things. And uh, um, Von Brown already knew me because uh, in 1952, on my 21st birthday, when I could at last have a, a beer legally, we had the first meeting of the American Rocket Society in Huntsville. And there were only 18 members. And I was one of them because I had joined when I was a teenager. And... Uh, I got my first legal beer down at the Russell Erskine Hotel when we formed that first chapter, Alabama section of the American Rocket Society. Anyway, um, anyway, I stayed in that particular business of measuring temperature for several years, and you know, and it gradually evolved into measuring other things. That uh, as I moved up the ladder, and I was involved in uh, many other types of instrumentation, and uh, the the Redstone evolved into the Jupiter and the, and the other little variations that people put names on, the Jupiter C and the Juno and the Juno II, and eventually the Saturn. So I remained in the instrumentation field uh, for quite a number of years. The, um, of course, with the... Uh, Who were you working with? Who were your associates? Well, the, uh, that was quite, it was actually, funny enough, it was the... Uh, the largest division in the largest lab of the uh, largest directorate of the largest center. So it was a, a very large group. The, uh, the leader of, uh, of the lab, of course, was Dr. Walter Horseman. The uh, leader of the division was, Walter, was uh, Otto Hoberg. The leader of the, uh, the division was uh, J.T. Powell. And uh, I eventually became his deputy. And... Um, as each of those people moved up, I became actually deputy director of the uh, of the division, and uh, was more or less uh, one of the people in charge of all the instrumentation on the the various uh, uh, projects we had, including the Saturn V. Saturn V had over 3,000 measurements that uh, we were responsible for, so it was quite a bit of uh, very diverse instrumentation, and I found that to be a very rewarding thing to work on because. Instrumentation reached across every aspect of the uh, of the programs. That is, you know, it's aerodynamics, propulsion, uh, the uh, uh, propellants. Every everything about the uh, programs were involved instrumentation because that was how we knew what was going right and what was going wrong. And uh, after every flight, uh, the measurements were questioned and. Sometimes we were questioned as to whether we had accurately reported what was going on. And of you, course, to you lived through then the transition from uh, rather primitive methods of recording <laughs> data to extreme automation, I imagine. That's right. We, uh, we went to a remote automatic checkout system. We went from uh, analog measurements to digital measurements. Uh, you know, to have 3,000 measurements on a single launch, it had to be automated. It had to, we had to go to more and more um, digital uh, measurements to improve the accuracy and in order to even be able to perform that many things uh, simultaneously. So it was, we went through quite an evolution on uh, how we were doing things. And about that time, we were going more and more to um, satellite activity. Of course, uh, Explorer 1 had been launched and we were responsible for the launch vehicle for that. And we were beginning to get satellite uh, uh, responsibility itself. Uh, the first really big satellite program we were involved in, I guess, was Explorer 7, which was uh, the satellite to catch up on all the International Geophysical Year programs that had failed to be launched by Vanguard. <laughs> yes, I remember. We called it the kitchen sink satellite because it had all of these experiments that were waiting to be launched for that in that program. And in the instrumentation group, we had engineers who were responsible to assist the, the principal investigators for each of their experiments. And I was lucky enough to be assigned to Dr. Vern Sumi in his heat balance uh, experiments. Uh, you may recall that. It was the first attempt to measure, measure the heat balance of the Earth, which is now of great concern. Of yes, course. indeed. <laughs> um, 
and Sumi was the expert on that particular uh, aspect of the uh, of the heat balance. He was the first person really to recognize how important that was. Uh, whether you have global warming or not, we certainly are concerned about the heat influx and uh, output of the Earth. And we made those measurements with Explorer 7. Uh, the, the deal being that, of course, the equatorial regions receive more heat than they export, and the polar regions uh, exp uh, export more than they receive. And then this ba balance causes the uh, the climate of the, of the planet. And the question is uh, whether the entire planet is, uh, is receiving more than it needs uh, or not. And this is a continuing question, but that was the first time we got a grasp on just how the planet is balancing its heat input and export. The, uh, anyway, that was the beginning of a real study of, um, of the heat balance of the Earth. And that was, do you remember what year? It must have been about uh, late 50s. Uh, mm -mm. I wrote a paper about that recently and I've already forgotten the dates. At any rate, we've got in more and more involved in that type of measurement. And I just, uh, in the early 1960s, we first heard the phrase remote sensing of earth resources. And I thought that was just the greatest thing I had ever heard of. Uh, it was like a new religion being revealed to me. And uh, I got very excited about this. And uh, it looked as if Marshall Space Flight Center might get that as a major assignment. And so uh, I got transferred in temporarily into the Advanced Projects Office to make an attempt to get that as a major assignment to Marshall. And uh, I got assigned to for several weeks at a time to NASA headquarters to try to uh, capture this program for Marshall as a uh, Marshall might become the lead center in this particular program. And I got other people at Marshall involved in this and it looked as if we might actually uh, get this assignment. And this as I say was in the, uh, well, I think we got up to about the mid 1960s by that time. And it looked as if uh, we would be successful. So we would become maybe the lead center for the, uh, the Earth Resources Program. And I pretty well persuaded the uh, Office of Space Sciences and Applications that this was the thing. I mean, the uh, Associate Administrator for OSSA was pretty well convinced that uh, Marshall should become the lead center for this. And this would have been a major plum for Marshall. Who was that at that time? Uh, let's see, would that have been Newell maybe? Uh, could, could well have been yeah, Homer I think Newell. it was Homer Newell. And his associates, uh, we, we had done a pretty good selling job on them. And at last it came down to the decision-making time. And of course, uh, the Manned Spacecraft Center was also looking for this particular job. And, and it was quite competitive. We were very competitive uh, at that time. And there was another program that both centers wanted, and it was called the, uh, the Orbital Dry Workshop, I believe, something like that. And at last, uh, unknown to me, there was a hideaway meeting up in North Carolina about that time. But uh, what they did to make the decision was that there was a meeting at uh, Long Beach, California, and uh, Gil Ruth and Von Brown and uh, a couple of henchmen like me and uh, somebody from Marshall who was working on the dry workshop and a couple of guys from um, Manned Spacecraft Center. I don't think it was called Johnson then, but we all went out to Long Beach, and uh, I guess Newell was there, and, and uh, George Miller was there. Nice. Yeah, and uh, Gil Ruth and Von Brown, and we all met in this little room in a motel, and uh, each made the pitch, you know. The... Uh, the dry workshop, there was a guy from Marshall and a guy from uh, Houston and, and the Earth Resources Program, they made a pitch, I made a pitch, and uh, Miller seemed to consider this. And he says, well, I think what we'll do, we'll assign the dry workshop to Marshall and we'll assign the Earth Resources Program to Houston. 
and boom, and my, uh, my heart dropped down into my stomach. And Von Brown looked very pleased that this dry workshop was coming to Marshall. And Gil Ruth looked very pleased that the uh, Earth Resources Program was going to Houston. And I spent the rest of the day just walking around on, in Long Beach and came back to Huntsville. We started sending all the uh, equipment and supplies down to Houston. And, and I went back to Astronics Laboratory and went back to my old job of instrumentation <laughs> and uh, moped around a while, moped around for, I guess, six months. and. Uh, didn't, you know, I had a job to do. In fact, I had a big job to do because the, uh, the dry workshop, which was renamed Skylab, was a, a challenging job, and uh, we had quite a bit to do on it with the instruments for the Apollo telescope mount, uh, the instruments to study the sun. It was a, a challenging job, and about that time, I moped around enough that they offered me a job in uh, administration of uh, the Skylab instruments on, on the ATM. I never knew that that would become a thing you could get money from for the bank. But uh, ATM was where you go to get money in these days. <laughs> and in those days, it was where you went to study the sun. But at any rate, we had... used acronym. Yeah, it's... Uh, uh, at any rate, we, uh, we worked on those instruments, but in the meanwhile, you know, I'm looking at Skylab, and, and here's the Houston, here are the Houston people having a grand time putting something on the Earth called EREP, Earth Resources Experiment Package. And that was studying what I wanted to study. That was the, those were the instruments to study the Earth on Skylab. And so I, I'm looking at those with great envy. And... Von Brown let me serve on committees to uh, select those instruments, which was nice. And there was another program going on that I was very envious of, and it was called uh, uh, Earth Resources Technology Satellite, ERTS. And this was an unmanned satellite program being operated out of Goddard Space Flight Center. And that was a wonderful program. Uh, no manned presence involved. And I got to work on committees that were selecting those instruments. And uh, that's where my heart lay, and I just, uh, this was, you know, this is 1966 now, and uh, Horseman sees me diligently <coughs> working like I'm supposed to be, but moping around, wishing I were working on those things. And I'm scurrying off to committee meetings, working on something I had no business in. And uh, all the time we were trying to get this Earth Resources Program to Marshall, I... Uh, was working pretty diligently with the education uh, branch there at Marshall, making sure that we would be able to get the courses for um, that program. And also, I was going to school on my own time at some school here in Huntsville called UAH. And uh, I was working on my master's degree. And I completed the, uh, the coursework out here and I'm working on a thesis, Logistics for an Earth Resources Program. And uh, so I was making great friends over at the education branch, and, and, uh, and I'm moping around, very unhappy that I'm not working on that program. And uh, I talked to Horsman about it, and I said, you know, I know all about instrumentation. I know how to ma make instruments to study the earth. I know how to make every kind of instrument there is. And I wish I were working in that program, but, you know, I don't... You know, they're talking about studying agriculture, and they're studying forestry, and they're studying oceanography, and they're studying uh, meteorology. And I don't really know anything about those subjects. I wish I could go to school and study those subjects. And he said, well, why don't you go to school? I said, well, you know, I'm finished at UAH, and they don't have a program in those subjects. And I said, I looked at Alabama A&M, and they don't really have an advanced program in those subjects. They've got a great agricultural school, but I need to go to some place that really specializes in remote sensing. And he says, well, look into it. I could, I could sponsor you in that. And he said, let me talk to Widener about it. So, talk to Von Brown about it. Okay. 
So I started looking into the schools, and um, the big schools for that subject were the University of Michigan and uh, University of California at Berkeley. I talked to those people. And um, University of Miami, Fred Singer was there. You remember? Yeah, I remember yeah, Fred. Yeah, I talked to Fred. And uh, <laughs> I went over to the education branch, and they said, well, you've been here at Marshall in the Army for 17 years, and the deal is that you could go off to school for one year for every 10 years you've been here. And we could stretch that, since you've been here 17 years, we could stretch that to two years. You could go off to school for two years, which should be enough to get you a, a doctor's degree. Right. And the other deal is you have to have shown you're interested in higher education, and you've been going to school at UAH on your own for uh, several years now. So that shows that. And you have to be working in something that's relevant to what we're doing. And we've got the Voyager program here to study uh, Mars with a big satellite, because that was technically uh, still possible. Well, it got canceled, of course, the next year, but that, that didn't count. And uh, you have to be, they have to be able to spare you from your job. I mentioned that to Horsman. He said, believe me, I can spare you from your job. He said, I would be glad to see you gone from here for two years. <laughs> so that, that was covered. So I got to, I seriously started looking at the schools. And so I thought about how cold it was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I thought about how crazy it was in Berkeley. And uh, so I thought, Miami is the place. So Fred Singer and I were making pretty good progress on that would be where I would go. And then he called me up one day and he said, don't come here. I'm leaving this place. I'm going to Maryland. So that was out. So then I got to pondering, well, I was looking at Purdue and I was looking at Kansas. Those were two, two other big remote sensing centers. And there was a salesman in my office, and I wish I could remember who he was, uh, but he said, you know, there's a University of Denver, is, uh, their geography department is trying to get a remote sensing specialty going. Why don't you talk to the head of that department and just see what, uh, what they have in mind? And he gave me the name of uh, the head of the department, uh, Dr. Griffiths. So I called uh, Dr. Griffiths and uh, explained to him what I was trying to do. And he said, oh, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the remote sensing program going within the geography department. And uh, we can tailor a program for exactly what you're looking for. And he said, now, of course, you don't have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree in geography. So if you came here, we would require that you take undergraduate courses in geography to get up to speed before you could really get into a, an advanced program in geography. But if you're willing to do that, we would, uh, would then tailor a, uh, an advanced uh, program in geography for you. And he said, of course, we require all of this uh, mathematics, and uh, if you'll send us your transcript from UAH, we'll see whether you had any math there or not. Well, believe me, UAH had a lot of math that I had already <laughs> passed. So, um, they liked my transcript from UAH, and um, the, uh, so the, all the cards fell into place. The, uh, the UAH background, the, uh, the Auburn background, the, uh, the fact that uh, Horsman was really glad to see me go for two years. So uh, everybody endorsed it, and off I went to the University of Denver. Uh, which was a private school. It's uh, not a state school. In fact, it belongs to the Methodist Church. The, uh, so, uh, 1967, 68, 69, I went to University of Denver and pursued a degree in geography. And uh, that was exactly the right thing. It was the right thing at the right time. Um, went to school there and uh, Thoroughly uh, enjoyed it. I, uh, the, and when I first got there, I don't know, I was in my late 30s then, and so I was uh, just about the oldest student there. I was the same age as some of the professors, and uh, the, uh, the students were suspicious of, it, of me and because they weren't sure I was serious. They figured I was out there to have a good time, which is what they were there for. 
the, most of the students there were there to go skiing. Uh, it had two mottos. It was called um, the uh, Berkeley of the uh, of the West, um, and some called it the Harvard of the East. But anyway, they. Um, I, I did well in school. I was, I was, I did very well academically. So the students pretty well accepted me then. The professors were suspicious too. They figured I was there to have a good time, and I made the top grades, so it, it was not a problem. So uh, we fit right into the community. I became president of the PTA where my children were going to school. Uh, everything worked out, and I, I came back to Marshall and. <laughs> went back to work in the astronautics lab on instrumentation. <laughs> and, and then, as luck will have it, the uh, NASA headquarters decided that the Earth Resources Program should be spread out to all the NASA centers, uh, all 10 NASA centers, there were 10 then, and that there should be an Earth Resources Program at every center. And that's what we did. We They wanted to... Uh, to spread out the responsibility for managing the various uh, uh, Earth, Earth Resources Technology Satellite had been renamed Landsat. And there were many, many uh, principal investigators using the data from Landsat, and they wanted to spread out the responsibility for managing those contracts to all the ten centers. Also, there were many investigators using the data from Skylab's Earth Resources Experiment Package. They spread those out to the ten centers. So we got assigned quite a number of those uh, uh, management responsibilities. And so Marshall set up a, um, an office called the Environmental Applications Office. This was a laboratory level office. And Dr. George McDonald was made director of it, and I was made deputy director of it. And we had a budget of several million dollars per year. And we did uh, research here in, uh, at Marshall, uh, mostly by contract to various uh, universities, including UAH and uh, Alabama A&M University, and about 20 some odd other universities around. And um, there was a reorganization at Marshall, and this work was assigned to the Data Systems Laboratory to analyze data from uh, the Skylab ATM, the solar data, and the Earth Resources data. And uh, a new office was set up called the Earth Resources Office within the Data Systems Lab, and I was made chief of that, that office. So this went on for some years, again, uh, with a budget of several million a year. And the, uh, the work was uh, primarily done by universities, including UAH. And, of course, the, uh, the data was uh, Skylab and uh, Landsat data. It was, it was a very enjoyable time, and it was a significant time, because these were data that were significant to uh, grassroots America. These were data having to do with agriculture and land use and forestry. Uh, it, was, uh, it was useful. This was a, a thing from space that was significant to the public. It, uh, it was a uh, benefit to mankind, a thing that we had been bragging we had all the time, but where, where you could actually see some positive results. I really liked it, and I still do. And then at last, of course, all good things come to an end. There was a budget cut, you know, something that NASA has, has seen increasingly over the years. And they decided they would close seven of the ten centers, that is, seven of the ten uh, Earth Resources offices at the uh, ten centers, and uh, Marshall's was one of them. That was 19... 78 that they decided to do that, and we managed to hold on until January of 1979 when uh, they closed the uh, Earth Resources Office at Marshall Space Flight Center. I was 47 years old. So uh, this, uh, and of course, you know, the way they do this, this is a reduction in force, RIF. And uh, of course, I was offered some very nice alternative jobs at Marshall, 
uh, jobs that a few years earlier I would have been happy with, but they didn't have anything to do with uh, Earth resources. And, uh, and so when, you, when that happens, you have a choice. They you can, were spoiled. Well, you know, I, yeah, I was for because uh, this was this was as if this, this, some guy had come along and had said, "Throw down your nets and follow me." You know, mm -hmm. this in the in the mid 1960s, somebody had come down from NASA headquarters and had said, "This is what the space program is all about. It's about helping all mankind." throw down these instruments that you've been using to study rockets and study the earth instead and follow me and that 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 impressed me so I didn't want to give up that program you know if I'd stayed at Marshall I couldn't even have pursued it as a hobby I wouldn't have had time so I let them force me into early retirement at the uh, tender age of 47 and forced me to take a pension that I could have lived on the rest of my life. So um, you can imagine the great reluctance at which I let them shove me out the gate um, and uh, took a job as uh, deputy director of the remote sensing division at uh, University of Tennessee within commuting distance of my home here in Huntsville. And we have an audience here. Uh, I, the uh, man has seen that terrible working conditions I have 60 miles from here the um, and I continued to work in the field I had loved and uh, and and they paid me to do that so uh, so I stayed in the field of, uh, of remote sensing of earth resources and uh, and still am I'm an uh, emeritus professor at uh, the University of Tennessee Space Institute a job which I also love and so I stayed in the field and since 1979. I left Marshall on a Friday afternoon and Monday morning I was uh, in Tennessee working at more or less the same thing. In the course of all that you collected or assembled quite a collection of photographs from Skylab and, and other places. And, uh, yeah, the, the, it, we didn't uh, immediately transfer that stuff to Tennessee. In fact, the bulk of it, uh, the the um, the equipment and the um, the imagery, a lot of it was uh, transferred to Alabama A and M University, and then what A and M didn't work, want, we later asked to be transferred to the University of Tennessee, and it was. And um, some of the things that uh, A and M was not interested in included the. Um, all of the handheld photography that the astronauts uh, took on Skylab. Uh, it was, um, for some reason, most of that stuff nobody seemed to want, and it was discarded. And um, I found it very interesting, and so I had the whole kit and caboodle transferred to Tennessee. We came down in a big uh, truck and, uh, and uh, trucked it up to Tennessee, and put it in our big um, imagery uh, collection there. And then several years ago when I was sort of semi-retiring from Tennessee, that is when they quit paying me, I never did retire. I'm still, as I say, an emeritus professor there. Still have an office. Um, but uh, they wanted to take the lab and use it for some other purpose and they asked me to uh, clean out the lab. So we transferred uh, most of the stuff to the um, um, geography department up in uh, Knoxville, but uh, they weren't interested in the uh, Skylab archives. And uh, about that time I read in the paper that UAH was trying to put together a Skylab uh, archive. So I called up um, uh, Ann Coleman here at the um, at the library at UAH and asked her if she would be interested in the in these Skylab pictures and she was and so we went up to, to Tennessee together and um, and picked up this let's see it was a truck pickup truck load and two car loads of, uh, of uh, Skylab pictures color photographs that uh, the astronauts had taken there's an interesting little aside to that 
a good friend, a geographer at uh, Johnson Space Center in Houston, had the unique ability to look at a picture of uh, the Earth and identify the location. He could look at a picture of any place on Earth and tell where it was, even ocean areas. I was amazed, that amazed me that he could do that. A fellow named Dick Underwood. Now he was given the job of identifying all these pictures. Well, you know, a piece of space junk, you know, a, a bracket, a boat floating around in, in, inside the zero G in Skylab, he, you know, he didn't take time to identify every cotton picking thing in there. And so, you know, he's got a photograph here and he would see something that he didn't bother to, uh, to, to identify and he made an unfortunate decision to write unidentified object on that photograph for the side because, you know, he just didn't bother to identify it. Didn't mean anything. So he put these in a stack over to one side and just not bother with them. Well, and then so NASA just sort of, you know, these were things they didn't want to fool with. And then some enterprising reporter found out that NASA had a stack of photographs from space that they didn't want to talk about much and that they were all in a file called un Unidentified Objects. And the more he inquired about them, the less NASA wanted to talk about them. So here was, the secret was out, that NASA had dozens of photographs of unidentified flying objects from space that they were trying to keep secret. So Dick was in big trouble. <laughs> and, they, you know, the more you tried to explain this, the less sense it made. Anyway, uh, UAH now has in their archives not only these rather interesting pictures from Skylab, but somewhere in all those pictures there are some unidentified objects. That, um, surely when this is known, this, there will be a, an investigation. <laughs> the, uh, well, it was very kind of you to uh, see that those came to UAH. Yeah, there's another thing that came to UAH, and this was for my own benefit. I, uh, I am trying to sort of retire, so uh, uh, I uh, have a what, 40, 50 year collection of uh, obscure geography journals. And I have donated those to the uh, yes, archives I, I have here. Seen those down there. So uh, they, uh, I figured that uh, UAH wouldn't have those particular journals. Nobody in their right mind would have those journals. So I have donated those too. And I guess someday they'll go into a um, recycling paper drive. But at any rate, uh, if you want to read an obscure geography journal, you've got them here. Well, that's a very good thing to have in the archive. <laughs> Geography is getting more important all the time in this world. Well, I was amazed. You know, I didn't know that geography covered such a broad uh, range of subjects. In fact, if you ask a geographer, all these other things are just subcategories of geography. See, uh, in some schools, geography is a part of the geology program. But believe me, a geographer will quickly correct that and let you know that geology is just a subcategory of geography. Of course. In fact, of course. meteorology is just a subcategory of geography. So um, geography encompasses just about all of the earth sciences. And if you want to really get a geographer going, try to persuade them that there really is a subject called earth system sciences, because that is just a synonym or geography by ignorant people who don't know what geography is. I sense that you're very proud of being a geographer. Oh, I am. I didn't even know what it was until I went to Denver, and now geography is just about everything. I love it. Well, is there anything else you'd like to put on the record with your experience with the space program while we've got a chance? Well, when I was a boy growing up in South Alabama, which my friend Oscar Montgomery, I think he coined the phrase Lower Alabama because he grew up there too. Oscar is um, a professor at Alabama A&M University. He and I grew up about 20 miles from each other and later met when he came to Huntsville. Uh, if you grow up in Lower Alabama and if you're poor, 
you want to get away from there. And when I was a very young boy, I really wanted to get away from there. And it seemed to me that if I would go to Montgomery, I didn't want to stay there either. I wanted to get way away from there. And I discovered uh, astronomy, and I thought, boy, now that's where I want to go. I want to go to another planet. Just staying on this planet is not far enough away. So I wanted to escape not just from Alabama. I wanted to escape from the whole planet. And so that's the reason I became interested in rockets. I thought, now that's the way to escape from this, this place. So uh, I guess when I was seven, eight years old, I started building rockets. I built a lot of small rockets. It's a wonder I didn't kill myself. My parents didn't know really what I was doing. <laughs> but uh, I built little rockets, and I built big rockets, and I launched them. That's the nice thing about growing up in the country. And I wanted to escape, and that, that's what I set my goal at doing. So you escaped all the way to North Alabama. Now, I love North Alabama, and, uh, but I, I love those rockets more. I tried to be an astronaut. That was another failure of the early 60s. I applied for scientist astronaut. I made it to the final 30. And of that final 30, they picked 15, and I was one of the 15 they didn't pick. Uh, but um, the, uh, of those 15 they did pick, only one ever got to fly. But uh, so I was probably lucky I didn't get picked. But uh, that was uh, that, that happened about the same time I was messing up on the Earth Resources Program. No, I wanted to escape, and uh, I've pretty, been pretty happy with the way it all turned out because I did escape. Well, maybe that's a good note to end the interview <laughs> on. Thank you very much for coming today, and. We enjoyed the chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.